Hey, welcome everybody. I am so happy that you joined me here this evening. I know Thursday night, 7 p.m. Thank you all for giving me a little bit of your evening. I am very lucky today. I have with me someone who, I mean, someone who thinks very differently about cities in a city that when we talk about what he's going to talk about, you're going you're to say, this guy can't be in New York City. But he is. He's with me. He is in New York City. The man who runs Market Urbanism Report. I hope I said that right. Scott Beyer. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you, Larry? I'm doing great. I'm so happy that you joined me here today. And for those of you more interested in what he's about to say, you can head over to his website, marketurbanismreport.com. Now, you talk about the idea of classical liberalism, the idea of a free market in New York City. And New York City, you know, is you know basically a communist state, right? City state, right? It basically is a, a communist city state. You must get pushback all the time from this. Yes. And I and I think that uh I, I do agree with you. It's a it's a status, it's a status city, as many big cities are in the country. And um, yeah, I think to, to just talk about my general premise, uh, not just for New York City, but for every city in the U.S. and really around the world, is I'm advocating for something called market urbanism. Ah, and so okay. Market urbanism, the definition of that is the cross between free market policy and urban issues. It is a classical liberal philosophy. That's where it's rooted from Chicago School Economics. Sure. Things like that. And I would really say that there's two definitions of market urbanism that I'm always advancing. One of them, which does not so much relate to New York City, is the idea that, um, and it's more theoretical, it's the idea that cities should have private governance, which- Cities um, should have private governments. Okay. Yes. That you're, you're speaking like, you know, like you're uh, speaking Russian to a New York City guy. So go ahead, tell me, please. Well, I mean, there, there's, um, there's already experimentations in, with this sort of thing happening around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they're sometimes called charter cities or special mm -hmm. economic zones. Yep. And it's the idea that you have a more privatized model for urban governance. So things that a public government might normally um, do, you could outsource to private companies and you could even have like a board of investors mm, run okay. as opposed to an elected council. And but, so, but isn't the fear, particularly in a city like New York, with our history, mm -hmm. isn't a fear immediately that if you create some form of privatization or board, is that oh, those elite bankers and developers are gonna run everything and crush the poor people? Isn't that the fear that someone immediately thinks about? Well, yeah, that that's why I'm saying also though that it's it's very. This theoretical model of market urbanism is something that I call abstract. Ah, it's, okay. It's theoretical in the sense that it doesn't really get tried anywhere around the world. I mean, some people do it on a, on a small case by case basis, sure. but that's kind of like the the radical theoretical version of market urbanism. Okay, so we, you know, I guess, what you're saying is that's like the place that we could start moving towards. Yeah, and um, how that works. I, I would almost say not we moving towards as so much as it could be tried. Um, ah, okay. It could at least be experimented with. And is so- Is this something that should be started in like a small city, like a like a Harrisburg with like 50 or 60,000 people in it? Or is this something that should be started in a relatively large city, like a, like a, a, a Philadelphia or a Phoenix? Uh, neither, to be honest. I, I'd say it would be, it would sooner be something that you would go to Texas and Texas has very- um, very loose laws about incorporating new cities. Ah, and okay. They're generally pretty hands off on what kind of provisions and and, and land use regulations that the that a city has to have, and so you could kind of have this um, blank slate that you could start a new city with in Texas, and it's even more like that in the developed world where um, I know somebody is experimenting. A, a group of investors is experimenting with a private city in Honduras. Hmm. Um, okay. and that would, that would be completely um, separated from the from the national government and just be able to run on its own. So again, though, um, kind of a radical idea. Yeah. I think, but I, I think the other version of market urbanism that I generally talk about more and that I think will be more conducive to the show 
is the idea of not full on libertarianism or mm -hmm. anarcho capitalism, but something that's kind of pushing in that direction. Okay. That's going into an existing city and um, embracing existing political realities and kind of pushing in the direction of libertarianism and kind of and offering a market based idea set of ideas for existing problems relating to housing and transportation and, and various public and men. Um, I like where you're going with that. I always want to move closer towards freedom whenever I can, realizing that, you know, we live in a very tough spot. A lot of people, they're afraid of it. They don't want to do it. They're scared. So I, I want to go to something which I think is controversial, mm -hmm. um, but you it's what you're talking about. You think that it's a good idea to have pay restrooms. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And we actually used to have pay restrooms in the United States and they still do exist around the world. I didn't actually get even interested in the concept until I visited Mexico and realized that uh, you can pay a small fee to use a, to use a private restroom. Um, basically, like people who run stores will open up their restrooms to paying customers. And so there wasn't this consistent problem that you find in, in other cities in the U.S., where if you have to go to the bathroom, you can't really find a place to go unless sure. you're unless you go into Starbucks and pay like five bucks for an orange juice. Right. But, um, but yeah, so basically we used to have four pay restrooms and they got illegalized because uh, activists thought that they were um, they they. they they do something that a lot of activists do where they talk about how there's a fundamental right to certain things, uh -huh. like a fundamental right to use the restroom. Therefore, it should not be for profit. You shouldn't oh, have to pay to do it. Got and, it. What, and what happens in the real world is that that then creates scarcity because when you take away the profit incentive to operate something, then the, then the entire business model goes away. So, but, but obviously the, the, the retort you're going to get is, See, Scott, you just hate homeless poor people, right? Because <laughs> then they won't be able to go to the bathroom. Why are you a mean guy? So I'm sure you have an answer for this. But, I mean, clearly someone's going to say, wait a minute, if we have pay toilets, what about the people who are poor? What about the people who are homeless? What about that? Well, I'd say they're already in a position where they're not able to use clean restrooms because – there has been because the profit motive has been taken away and this business model has been made illegal. Um, the private sector doesn't provide it. And then the government, I think this is a, this is probably just as crucial as a point is the early activists thought that the government should then come in and provide the restrooms. Cause what could go wrong with government? What could go yeah, wrong? The, 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 the government doesn't provide restrooms effectively. And one real world example I could, I could mention is the public lose that, San Francisco tried to provide um, that were basically just kind of like these street loos. You see them in um, San Francisco and Los Angeles, but it's provided extremely expensively. There was a lot of um, potential corruption going on between the contractor and the city government. Mm -hmm. And then of course it, it wasn't, um, they're not safe. Like they, they ended up getting occupied by drug addicts. And so people who actually had to use the restroom could not safely use them. Right. So that's an example of where basic public choice problems of a government trying to run a service, there's no profit incentive in place. And so there's no incentive to, to either to, to provide the restrooms or provide them effectively. Um, so the interesting thing is if we did have a for-profit model, yeah, I could, I could see in places um, that have a lot of homeless people, such as Skid Row in Los Angeles, or uh, the Tenderloin in, in San Francisco, I could see private companies providing porta johns on those streets and maybe charging 25 cents. Um, and I, I think homeless people could come up with 25 cents. And so they would be able to use a, rest, a clean restroom provided by a private company where now they're literally having to go on the street. No, that that's an interesting point because I do think, you know, that, and I don't mean it to be cruel at all, I mean, homeless people can come up with 25 cents. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I've seen them do it many times, right? They're, they're able to eat. They're able, and, and, and some homeless people are actually working poor. So if you actually are working poor and you're homeless, well, then clearly you have enough. You can do 25 cents to go to a bathroom. And, and I, I get it. It just, it, it tastes bad to someone who thinks, well, don't you want to help the homeless person? But I get your point. I think it's a valid point. 
Scott, can I take a couple of comments? There's a lot of people commenting. You okay with me taking a couple of comments? Sure. Sean says, uh, Mr. Mr. Buyer does great work. I love that. There we go. I love Thank it. you, Sean. Yes. Um, Liberty Shamrocker, I don't know who that is, but she says, great topic. Good evening. So she likes what you're talking about. I love that. So good. Craig says, privatization, market ur uh, urbanism, school of economics, capitalist propaganda. Um, it sounds like Twitter. <laughs> yes. It's I like love that. Twitter feed. Perfect. Um, Jimmy says, am I hearing decentralization? Is that part of what you're saying, decentralizing? It is. Yeah, I, I love the word decentralization. And I know that you could probably relate to this as well, where I view a lot of the political struggles in this current era as not being so much Republican versus Democrat. It's being centralization versus decentralization, mm -hmm. authoritarianism versus libertarianism. Absolutely. The, the big versus the small, um, you know, things like that. I am I'm a big, big proponent of setting up a system with a freer market that takes the big guys down without government. I'm a big fan of that. I'm I'm with you. I I'm, I'm totally with you on that. The, my my concern I guess is New York City because I live here and I'm born here. Um it seems like a different beast, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like I, I don't have data to back this. This is just my emotion, right? I feel like New York City's a different beast because it's so big. Because it's so dense, um, I feel like that's that that a lot of these things would have to be different. Like you bring up the idea of tolling, you know, tolls being like a good thing. Like tolls can be good, but my image of tolling in New York City is you know eighteen dollars to cross a bridge, right? Mm -hmm. That's my image of tolling. So I I feel like tolling affects the poor and middle class because the wealthy already live in Manhattan. So they don't get hit by the tolls. Am I wrong with this? Is, is is New York City a different animal, or could this work anyplace? Well, I think I, I asked like four different questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> the issue you bring up with tolls of, about it being regressive, I think that applies anywhere, and so that could be. Um, you could structure the payment system in the way that, in a way that the people who really cannot afford to drive and pay the tolls might get a discounted rate or get some sort of rebate at the end of the year. But I think in general, the people who are driving are generally higher income than the people who are taking transit. And that's the case in New York City as well. I mean, you think about like people coming in from New Jersey, that's in a lot of cases, that's the suburban business class who are working on, in Midtown and Wall Street. And so I think they can foot the higher, um, the higher toll. Now, I look at tolls as being a replacement for specific types of taxes or fees. Oh, okay. So, so you're saying remove the taxes and add the tolls is what you're saying, not just add tolls. Yeah, I, I would view tolls as a better way to fund roads than say gas taxes. Okay. So that would be so I'm I'm not necessarily coming from it to it from a status position of let's get more revenue for the government and make the government bigger. It's more along a philosophical line of let's make let's make services pay for themselves. Okay. And so that would be one use of a toll. Um, I think another use of the toll, and I, I don't know if this is something you would agree with or not, but I view um, cars are somewhat of an externality, particularly in a place like New York. Mm -hmm. They create a lot of air pollution. They bring, they create noise. Yep. Um, I think at this point, they, there's, there's more traffic related deaths than there are gun murders in New York City. I don't so, know. Recently, we had a bad year, so that may not be true. But yes, um, but, actually, I, I think bicycles are being a, a problem now because of cars and bicycles having to share the road. I yeah. think bicycles are a really big issue in New York City right now, right? The extra bike lanes we put in, bikes getting hit. I think that's really uh, has been our issue right now is, is bikes and cars and pedestrians. And it seems to me whichever one you are, you hate the other two. <laughs> so if you're a pedestrian, you hate all these cyclists and, and, and drivers. If you're a driver, yeah. you hate all these cyclists and, and, and pedestrians, right? You, you yeah. hate whatever you aren't. And, and don't forget mopeds. Like I know that rebel mm. mopeds have kind of been back and forth politically in the city yep. and, and electric bikes, which go a little bit faster than a normal bike. Yep. So, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of the questions that a market urbanist is looking at is they're saying, a, there's a there's only a, a set amount of right-of-way in a place like New York City. Sure. It's very valuable space. 
and there's a lot of people competing with for it and who want to use it. Right. And so you got to balance on so, in some hand, on some hand, there's environmental goals. Like I think more people riding bikes is going to be better for the environment than more people in cars. Sure. But, but at the end of the day, I think the pricing of the right of way is what gives you market feedback to determine how the right of way should be used. If that makes any sense. So what you're saying is if we do things like um, congestion pricing and things mm-hmm. like that, then people, if they really want to go into the city, they'll pay the price to go to downtown. And if they don't, then they won't pay the price. But, right. But, but doesn't that again become regressive, right? I'm sure someone who can't afford it probably, I assume, still probably wants to go downtown and see cool stuff in Manhattan. Right. Doesn't the rich person say, ah, I'll, I'll pay the $45 for the cab ride. And the poor person goes, or the middle class person goes, do I really want to drop 45 bucks for a cab ride? Is, is that, Am I wrong on this? Well, so there, I think one of the keys of congestion pricing is making it dynamic. So in certain parts of the day, usually morning and, and evening rush hour, it's going to be very expensive. Other parts of the day, it's cheaper. So I think that would that, that dynamic pricing spreads out the demand across the day. If you don't really need to make a trip during rush hour, you can, you'll can you make a trip at an alternative time. So I think it takes away congestion. Mm-hmm. And then I think another thing that it does is it encourages ride pooling because ah, if, okay. if if five people are are splitting the cost of road use by getting together into say an Uber or a Lyft, um, that's more efficient and and ultimately will lead to a faster way to get around than everybody being in the in their own car. So um, yeah, I, I look at it as a con- I guess the short term benefit of it is that it relieves congestion. But I think a long-term kind of big picture thing that that road pricing does is it's going to help the private mass transport industry scale because Mm. it's going to change the financial incentives of road use. And so I look at a service like Uber, which now mostly just carries around one or two passengers as potentially scaling up into a bus service, which it's doing in some cities around the world. Yeah. Wow. All right, let me grab a couple more comments. I got people commenting. You you got people excited, so that's good, I guess. So Tom says, I remember when I used to be oppressed with pay phones. (laughs) I I like that, Tom. I remember too. I still remember. uh, If you're like under 30, under 20, you may not know what the phrase drop a dime means. I have no idea. That's that's a basketball phrase. Drop a dime is you (laughs) would drop a dime in the pay phone to call somebody and tell on somebody. That's where drop a dime. Co- Tom and I are old enough. We remember it used to be a dime to in a payphone to call somebody. So that's where that that thing drop a dime. You get you put a, a dime in a payphone and you call and snitch on somebody. And that's where you drop a dime on somebody used to be. Yes, I know. Tom and I are old. It's fine, but yes, that's what I, I remember payphones too. I absolutely do. Yes. So um, John says I paid fifteen pesos to use a restroom outside of Tulum, Mexico. It definitely made the top three worst restrooms I encountered in my 50 years on the planet. So I, I guess the question about that, I mean, it's a good point, right? If does it, does it make for a better, worse or the same restrooms? How does, if we went, we're going back to restrooms now. If, if we do the paid restroom, as you said, in say San Francisco or whatever, how do you make it worth it to where it's worth you know, it, it's worth to have an attendant there or whatever is the way you clean the toilet. I, I don't know. Is there like a spray down thing? What, whatever you do, right? Yeah. How do we make it worth it? Okay. That reply person did have a valid point. So I just got from back from Monterey where the pay restrooms don't have toilet seats and don't have paper and um, are absolutely disgusting in some cases. But I think you, it's kind of a weird comparison because you have to look at the economics of Mexico versus the economics of the U S like, okay. I, I think the it's poorer. And so whether or not the restrooms are for pay or are for free, they might just not be as, as well kept and supplied as well as in a, as a for pay American restroom would be now. So, I mean, the, the research that I did said that for pay restrooms in the U S used to be quite nice and were really well kept. And the ones in Mexico, they're substandard by US standards in the way that a lot of things are substandard in, in Mexico compared to the US because it's a poor country. Like mm-hmm. the housing is less 
is less up to code and things like that. So, okay. Miss, Missy says, coming from someone who has actually been homeless, there were times when I couldn't even find a dime. All right, so maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe there's times when you when you couldn't. Could you find a situation to where you could have a a series of or a larger bathroom that is a sponsored by someone, um, and then they get their name on it, and then that could be free, or or could you have a a pass that someone? I don't know. Is is that something that that is there any example of free, free privatized? Does that make any sense? Free privatized uh, bathrooms. Is there such a thing? Well, you could have a voucher system um, distributed by the government. So um, you put a bunch of porta johns in a in a homeless encampment, and the the government or maybe a philanthropist distributes a voucher, and they're able to use the restroom. But I mean, I. I think we need to stress again, though, that the current status quo is worse than anything mm. I'm, that I've suggested. I mean, where the homeless literally have to use the streets in many cases. And that does happen in some of the worst neighborhoods in San Francisco and New York City, too. New York City, too. Yes, uh, so, absolutely. So, so, I mean, that's that's the status quo where we're trying to disrupt. No, I love what you're saying. I, I say all the time when people attack my plans. I say, please don't compare my plan to perfection because mm -hmm. I lose every time. And so does every other plan. Instead, you know, compare my plan to status quo. Is it worse mm -hmm. than status quo? Then I lose. Is it better than status quo? Well, then I'm winning, aren't I? So I'm with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it was the great, and I'm by, by great, I mean great, uh, Thomas Sewell, the economist, sure. who, who said that pretty much every policy – he said the phrase compared to what has mm -hmm. to be the predominant question that you ask about every policy, because otherwise, you, you know, the skeptics can kind of create the straw man where they're, of course, they're, they're saying, well, it's not perfect. So it's therefore it's not good. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it leads to a lot of bad situations in, in policy. I mean, another example I could say would be when I went to Monterey, Mexico, mm -hmm. by the way, there were not many homeless people that, you know, compared to the, to San Francisco, New York, there were not sure. many, there was not a visible homeless problem. Okay. Well, a lot of the reason for that is that they have favela neighborhoods that are generally not very well serviced by the government are not up to code by any stretch. I actually unwittingly walked through a couple and they feel like third world encampments. Sure. But it's, it's at least a minimum standard that people can live in that will prevent them from being homeless. And in the U.S., we can't build that kind of settlement because there's so much regulation. And so it would be a, a classic case where something that's clearly not perfect is still better than the absolute worst outcome that there could be. Well, I, I guess my, my concern here is uh, you've also discussed the idea uh, of zoning, right? Since we're kind of in that world now with building things and zoning, that Mix zoning isn't great. Zoning in general isn't great. You're not a fan of zoning at all. You're not really a fan of zoning. That, I'm sure to so many people, they're scared. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you're going to put a pig farm next to me and they're going to be slaughtering pigs next to me or you're going to put a factory next to me and they're going to be making, you know, whatever, a big stack of smoke, you know, pouring into my backyard, right? Isn't everyone afraid of that? Isn't that why so many people want zoning? Well, again, that's kind of the most extreme, like that's a caricature Mm -hmm. argument where you're taking the most extreme possible scenario and saying, this is how it's going to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I would say particularly in a place like New York City. So so let's examine what would happen in a place like New York City if it suddenly didn't have zoning. Mm -hmm. What I don't think would happen is I don't think you would get a bunch of industrial smokestacks opening up in the city. And the reason right. is that the land values there are very high. Sure. And there are certain uses that a company high land values. And, and guess what? A pig pen is not one of them. It's a true. smoke stack is not one of them. Those, those types of industries have an advantage in locating further out um, where, where land is cheaper and more horizontal and everything. And so I think in 2021, market forces would do a very appropriate separation of a lot of uses in cities that zoning actually does not do very well right now. Like a lot of, in New York City, a lot of the industry, a lot of the kind of the incompatible mix between industry and, and residential that exists, say, in places like Brooklyn, 
mm-hmm. is Duke is because of zoning. Like, yeah. It's because of zoning. Zoning's Queens too. Same thing. Queens too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this, this legacy industrial zoning that says we need to have blue collar jobs here. Right. And so I think if, if we were to have a market force, a, a market based um, system, I think what you'd get is just a lot of high density housing. I, I think the, um, you know, even office is kind of a, is kind of a shaky sector at this point. And, mm, yes. and so is retail. And yep. so I think, um, you know, you want the absolute quickest way for, for New York city to address this affordable housing shortage, just, just in zoning because. Wow. The- that's so radical to New Yorkers. We're all about it. And we're all NIMBY. Right, we're all yeah. not in my backyard. We use zoning to stop people from doing stuff, and we go and fight in the board, and then we and then we wind up, you know, uh, we, we we landmark our stuff so that no one yeah. can build anything on it. You're like yeah. you're being like the anti New York City guy. I I love it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against what you're saying, it's, right. but but you're like a New York City heretic saying that. Right? It's crazy. Well, I hope that the that the skeptics who are watching watching this though can see the logic of what I'm saying, which is that. If you look at the different sectors of real estate, office is on the decline. Mm-hmm. Retail is on the decline with the yep. rise of Amazon. Um, industry is not necessarily on the decline, but would probably not be built in New York City for the reasons I explained earlier. However, there is a huge housing shortage in the city. Yeah. So, I mean, basic market economics and price signals should tell us that if you loosen the zoning and if you just let the market work, the developers would be building housing. That is what is going to be in their bottom line. And so I would see a very quick um, reduction in home prices and in, in, in a, a long-term end to the housing shortage. Okay. Let me grab a couple more comments. Uh, Rebecca's a fan. She says, Scott is, I suppose he is, is the man. So I guess you're the man. I like that. <laughs> Good. Roy brings up a point. He says, but New York City residents benefit from great roads even if specifically if they don't use them. So is is that a valid you know piece that okay we're not using the roads but we should have great roads anyway or no? I, well I'd be curious by use them does he mean drive on them? Because I don't know how anyone could possibly not use the roads like pedestrians use the roads as well. Mm, okay. So, so that's kind of what I'm getting at because I think um there's many people who want to use the roads. And I actually wrote an article talking about the 10 different things that people would use New York City curb space for. And it's not just, I mean, some of it is like the vendors selling selling hot dogs. Yep. And so a market-based system, I think, would 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 transfer road space away from the dominance that the automobile now has over it. Because I mean, you know, you go down the Avenue of Americas and it's like a vast majority of that road space is being taken up by the automobile. Yep. The, the pedestrians are crunched together on the sidewalk, trying to navigate around the, the bike share, like the dockless bike yes. share and, and everything like, and um, you know, the food carts and the vendors. And so it's like, let's have a conversation using market-based pricing on what people are willing to pay to use what amount of space. And so- I think you see a much more diversity. See, but you brought up the word diversity that I that I think people are afraid of. It. And I get it because John brings this up. John says there are some barrier islands here in Florida that have some 15 to 20 dollar tolls to keep undesirables off the island beaches. And I think that's a. I mean, we have a legacy of that in America. So isn't there an emotional thing that says, "Ooh, you know, uh, Scott, at this, it feels like then we're going to have we're gonna have no we're gonna have segregation we're gonna have the rich people here and the poor people there and no one's gonna talk isn't there an emotional barrier to this that we just from our legacy we go this just doesn't taste good yeah okay so two things that I think would one thing that would need to happen in order for road pricing to be put into effect is liberalized housing policy ah uh, okay yeah. so this isn't by itself we've got a bunch yeah. of things we got to do yeah, Northern Virginia would be a perfect example of, of an area that told that it, it, it kind of did both things wrong in the sense that DC is very restrictive. Sure. So you can't afford to live in DC at this point unless you're either rich or living in a rent controlled apartment. And at the same time, they're pricing their roads quite high in some cases. So yeah, you are um you're hurting the poor in that mm. case because you're not giving them an option 
like they still have to drive because yes. of because of the restrictive zoning and now you're sticking this regressive fee on them. So yeah, I understand that point absolutely. And that's and that's kind of why a, a larger market urbanism vision says deregulate transportation and deregulate housing at the same time and let market forces work for both. Well, it's funny you bring that up because many of the reasons why people have to drive so far is because they can't live next to where they work. Exactly. Right? Yeah, right. Exactly. If you can live close to where you work, you don't have to drive. I completely agree. It makes total sense. So Andrew says cities developed after invention of automobiles are structured differently than ones before. Same for infrastructure and centrally planned governments who pay for maintenance, maybe need to redesign. And I want to bring this up because I think a good example of this in the world is Japan. Mm -hmm. I live in Japan for four years. Hmm. And what what people don't most people don't know is there's a northern island of Japan called Hokkaido. That was the last island that was really developed by the Japanese. The cities in Hokkaido are way different than the cities on the mainland. The mainland, I mean, there's there have been Japanese cities for literally like 2,000 years. There have been Japanese cities for a very long time, far before there were cars, right? They, they, they had the emperor in like, you know, the year 700. So they, they've had cities for a very long time. So it's a big difference. Is it time for a redesign or is it time for us? And I'll, I'll do the, the terrible thing, the terrible example, Europe. Mm -hmm. Europe was bombed like there was no tomorrow. So you get to rebuild because you're bombed, right? Terrible mm -hmm. reason to rebuild, but there's an advantage. You can build a better city. Is it time for us to be redesigning? And the reason why I said is you know how New York works. New York doesn't like redesign. New York just slowly morphs, right? Like, right. like that. Where, where do you go on that, Scott? Well, so one thing that, that I think is really um, interesting to point out there, and, and the bigger way to understand transportation in this country is that it is government controlled. It mm -hmm. is socialized. Um, there was a time when it was not like that, but everything from the street grid that is laid out in, a, in modern cities to the interstate system was generally designed by the government. And so what I think that, and it's still regulated by the government and funded by the government today. Yes. What I think that prevents is it prevents fiscal discipline in the sense that if you're a, if say if you're a private city and you wanna do something that's that has cost advantage, you might create a 25 foot, a road that's 25 foot wide, but in a planned city that is propped up by government subsidy that is often indirect and coming from higher levels of government, sure. you and might- the, And the money all has strings attached that says you must do X or Y. And the money ha all has strings attached that come with specific codes mm -hmm. that have to be followed and in, in, in engineering standards. Everything is wider and more engineered than it would be in a free market. And there's all kinds of like individual examples that you just see everywhere from Twitter to various blogs showing roads the way they used to be designed when mm. entrepreneurs were designing them because there is of course a trade-off. Like you don't, you don't want to consume if you're a private entrepreneur who is dealing with, with certain land costs and economic factors. Sure. You don't want to make a road wider than it has to be because that takes up space for, for potential building for potential real estate. Um, and so on the other hand, when it's socialized and, and the costs are disconnected from each other, why not make it wide? Because that's what the people want Sure, you know, under some phony theory. So yeah, to, to put it, to put a more precise point on it, roads are wider and more over-engineered because they are run by the government. There we go. Look at that. Craig says you hate whatever you aren't. Change that and we make the world a better place. I'm with you, Craig. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Liberty says, drop a dime turned into, <laughs> here's a quarter, call someone who cares. That's true because it went from a dime to a quarter. I remember. Yes, that's right. It was drop a dime on somebody and then it became, here's a quarter, call someone who cares. Now, if you said that to someone, they'd say, why'd you give me a quarter? I got a cell phone. <laughs> why'd you give me a quarter? And if, and if you're like under 20, they go, call? What's that? <laughs> so they wouldn't even know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, Mitchell says, I used a, a pay restroom and took a shower in a train station in Italy. It was lovely and clean. Yes. Ah, this kind of goes to what you were talking about, Scott, that it depends upon the country. Yeah, Europe, 
Europe still has pay restrooms and they are, um, from what I hear, they are, are quite uh, to a high standard and very well maintained. There we go. Steve says, I don't know if I like the idea of having um, having to have a government voucher to use a public restroom. They'll tie it in with the Excelsior Pass. Yeah, um, you got to have the COVID um, vaccine or something, right? And people like me will have nowhere to go. Well, I think that's a valid point. If, if you do the voucher, doesn't that come with government strings attached too, right? You got to do X or you got to do Y or you you know, got to submit this or submit that. Isn't that going to be an issue? Well, I mean, the voucher wasn't a specific policy recommendation on my part. It was just answering a specific, um, you know, question, which is what if the homeless still cannot afford to use the restroom? Well, you could have a voucher system. I mean, that you that's something you could do. I would happen to think that the homeless could probably find a way to pay for the market rate of a restroom if if the provider is only providing porta johns, mm. like that, that's just kind of a low standard thing you could stick onto the street, and um, I don't think it would cost very much. So if if we mm. if we go with a kind of a bottom up growth model in a city, don't you run into the the fear and maybe the reality that if it's bottom up and growing without heavy government control, you know you get the the slums of Mexico City. Or the massive sprawl of, I don't know, Houston or something, right? I mean, you just, you get something like that, don't you? Or maybe you get the, the problems you have in New Orleans where, you know, people are like just ready to be destroyed by the next wave that comes by or something like that. Is it that a concern? Well, it's, a, it's interesting. So you <clears throat> you mentioned three different kinds of urban models. So I would have yep. to... I would have to address each one. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I was just talking <laughs> trash. I apologize. Pick the one that makes the most sense for you, Scott. I'm sorry. But I well, but that I, was I, the that was the fear that comes, right? If if government doesn't control it, then there'll be some crazy stuff like one of these three cities. Yeah. Okay. Well, so going one by one, I think the uh the favelas that you find in Latin America would are not a fundamentally bad thing. Um, if you don't want to go to them, you don't have to. <laughs> but I mean, people live there and it it has benefited them. Um, and I think that having, say, if the, if the modern homeless that occupy many of our cities were able to build some sort of encampment or tent city without um, the government coming in and doing sweeps. And there's even like philanthropists who provide land nowadays for them to be able to do that mm -hmm. or they can do it under the underpass. I think that would be... Um, that would be a market outcome uh, for the extremely low income. And I think it would be better than what they're able to obviously living in a tent on the street. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, there's often safety standards that can be established in these types of communities. So um, it, it's kind of like somebody is saying that's the, that's what the market will do. And I'm saying, well, that's actually a, a, a that's, that's a better alternative than what we have now. Okay. Okay. So uh, now, okay. now do uh, Houston sprawl? Yeah. Do you think Houston is is better off, or would be worse off without it? Oh, I think the sprawl for Houston has has actually been good. Um, okay. It has, it has maintained. It has stabilized the home prices there. Um, hmm. Houston has some of the fastest growth in the U.S. And yeah, I know it it's our it's our fourth biggest city now. It is, um, and actually, yeah, it's a. Uh, Huge metro. I mean, almost a global mega city at this point. And um, yet it has median home prices below the national median because it, it builds so sure. much. Home. So this is literally what you're saying. You have a, you have a so you're saying don't do New York City and do rent control. Mm -hmm. Instead, do Houston and let people build and you'll solve your housing problem by just letting people build. Yeah. Build in the city, build in the suburbs, build in the exurbs. I mean, wherever wherever people want to settle. I mean, the only qualifier I might add to this is that kind of going back to the socialized road system that we were talking about earlier, I think to some degree, people in Houston are incentivized to live in sprawl rather than living in, in the center city because the roads are built for, for free, quote unquote, and they're used for free, quote unquote. Um, and so it, it, it's a system of incentives that kind of stretches the development pattern out further ah, okay. and leads to certain environmental waste 
But um, so you're saying if the roads in the case of Houston were more expensive to use, mm -hmm. that people would create more businesses locally in their in their neighborhoods and wouldn't have to go to the city center? Um, well, no, what I'm saying is that I think the settlement pattern, which generally you were, we were talking earlier about the sprawling settlement pattern. Yep. I don't know that we would have this much sprawl if it weren't incentivized so much. Oh, like, you're saying people might actually move into the city center instead and you yeah. get more high rises and such. Yeah. And Houston, Houston is getting a lot of that. I mean, it's not, it's not just sprawl. Mm -hmm. Like Houston has a lot of is getting a lot of new skyscrapers and multifamily in the in the urban core, and I'm saying effectively that the market would probably produce more of that if we didn't have this system of in, of incentives that makes it really cheap to have to to build horizontal infrastructure that people then use at for free. Got it. Got it. Okay, so let me grab a couple more comments if I could. Uh, Liberty says she's trying to follow my 80-20 rule. My 80-20 rule means, if you don't know, it means if you agree with someone 80% of the time, they're an ally, even if you disagree 20%. She likes your roads. She's not happy with your bathrooms. She's not, she's not buying it, Scott. Sorry. She's buying the roads. She's not buying the bathrooms. But I get well, it. I'm, well, I'm the, good news is, the good news is it's not going to happen anytime soon anyway. So. There we go. See? <laughs> She's going to win anyway. I love it. Um, Matthew says, I agree. I'm running for city council on abolishing zoning. Wow, you got a guy who was right with you. That's uh, Matthew, my ears. Yeah, you might want to go over to if I click right to to the marketurbanistreport.com, and you might want to read some of the stuff about that there. So I'm just saying, maybe you uh, if you're running for office, you might want to just make that click over there, read a couple of things, maybe send an email. I'm sure he they, they'd be more than happy to chat with you about the zoning issues. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to. Am, am I right? Yes. There we go. More than happy to. So yeah. you might want to go do that. Andrew says, my hometown has so many zoning laws that it's hard to start a business and to have a business even in the town. I offered to have the business owners decide what zoning laws that want to make it easier to have in a business in the town. It didn't happen. Wow. So, yes. Yeah, so now the zoning laws here in this case, what he's saying, Scott, is it's stopping not just people from living, but from, from starting businesses. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's the other thing we cover. I mean, we mostly talked about how zoning, you know, is an impediment to new housing. But it's also very much of an anti-business uh, regulation, and it, there's kind of some overlap between occupational licensing and zoning working together to prevent startup entre entrepreneurship. But I mean, like in a lot of cases, um, I remember studying Detroit one time in, um, in in their zoning code and how like they had all these great entrepreneurs like Barry Gordy who who started out of their basement or yes. out of their garage sure. and, and like created incredible businesses. And now in Detroit, home-based businesses are illegal. Although I'm sure many people still do it. But I'm I mean, sure they do. Cause, cause prohibition always works. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Yes. But, but still it's kind of crazy. It's like, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you can't afford necessarily office space. And so a home-based business band, which usually comes about through zoning, is um it's just another example of how zoning is regressive and hurts people winds up hurting the poor i agree karen says the homeless in ithaca new york is increasing at an incredible rate the unfortunate thing about being homeless is they can't get benefits or assistance because they don't have an address department of social services won't allow them to use a p.o box because they live in tents what is known as the jungle they need help regardless uh, of maintaining an address I think it's exactly right. If, if there were tiny homes or small areas, you could create addresses and they could get the help. I, I think you're right. This is kind of what you're saying, Scott, right? I mean, at least at least if you're in an area like that, the mail can get to you, right? Because mm -hmm. they know where you are and you can have an address that has a number on a street or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, when people talk about you know, I mentioned earlier that the homeless should be able to form encampments. Mm -hmm. And I know that word probably sounds to a skeptic, it's probably sounds bad, but it's not as it's not as bad as it sounds. I mean, there's a lot of kind of private governance models that come with homelessness um, or homeless encampments. Sometimes they're like HOAs where they have actual rules that ah, are right. workable and they have some sort of government governing structure that ensures things like safety and security and um, maybe even shared utilities. So it's, it's not, 
it's not literally just put a bunch of tents under an underpass. Right. It, it, it's more sophisticated than that when it's allowed to be. And um, yeah, I think it would have the effect of helping people normalize their lives, have a mailing address, have a, have a safe place to sleep. So, so, on and so forth. let's, let's deal with some of the things that have happened recently and how you think maybe a more market, um, if we were more market driven even before or even during um, the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it hit New York city hard, right? It hit us hard. We're packed in together. The pandemic hit us hard compared to other, you know, places. Does it matter if it's, you know, market urbanism or no? Is it better, worse, the same? Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. So I, you know, science, science and pandemic and public health policy isn't necessarily a, a huge focus of market urbanism. Mm -hmm. um, I will say it, it seems like the lockdowns are, uh, they're excessive though. I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems like there could be a more market-based way and just allowing people to make their own decisions about health and, and follow their own, you know, health and financial self-interest. I think erring in that direction over having, you know, unilateral shutdowns from one man uh, is a much better model. So you're saying if, if it was more localized, I guess, or more, um, you know, more privatized in that regard, that individual units within a, within a, a city could decide, hey, we need to lock down or we shouldn't lock down or whatever the case may be, that that would be more effective or more efficient? Um, yeah, I mean, well, we kind of had that with the 50 states. You know, the 50 states all had their different, um, you know, policies that they did. And sure. Florida was much more open. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it's like it, the proof is in the pudding in the sense that a, a bunch of people are moving from New York to Florida, which tells and, me yeah. that they're – kind of like their revealed preferences show that they want less of a lockdown than right. New York is now imposing. Absolutely. So yeah. So yeah, more, more localism. And I also think just like maybe more an appeal to basic constitutional rights as far as freedom. Where, where in New York that, that constitution suggestions. <laughs> it's not right. Suggestions. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing everybody. Don't get mad at me. I'm again, tons of hate me. I'm just teasing. I'm joking. I'm joking. So yes. But, you know, I, I want to take a second to, to, to do, give a quick commercial, guys. We're talking about the pandemic. So do me a favor. Head on over to that link right there. That link, it's, it's up in the uh, show description. That is the advocates.org pandemic survey. They are a sponsor of mine. And they would like you, please, it's free. Head on over there. Take that survey. Talk about, you know, see what you talk, think about lockdowns, mass mandates, all the things that happened during the pandemic. What do you think about it? What's your opinion? Fill out that survey and share the survey and let people know you've taken it. And it will also show you what other people think also. It's free. They're my sponsor. Makes them happy. Makes you happy. Support the show. Give me five minutes. Take that test and share it. Finish the test and share it. Theadvocates.org the pandemic survey. Please take that today. It helps me tremendously. Also, if you've taken it already, like, comment, and share this. Let people know this is happening. If if you like what we're doing here, you see me doing it, let people know how else we're going to grow. How else we're going to make people like me and Scott famous if you don't go out there and comment and share? It's not going to work that way. And of course, if you think that you can help me out and you've got some spare, an, enough money that you can get uh, one of those pay bathrooms, throw some money my way. <laughs> Patreon.com slash short way. 10 bucks a month helps me build my team out so I can keep doing this more and more and more. Thank you, Scott, for letting me do a commercial. I appreciate it. I, <laughs> so, hope, I, hope, it, I hope it doesn't cost $10 to use a restroom. It I'm doesn't, but I'm just making that up because I want 10 bucks. That's all. I want 10 bucks. So I'm just making it up. <laughs> so, you know, um, there used to be a service, uh, a service in New York City that unfortunately shut down, but it mm -hmm. was called Louie. And it was an app where you could, where people could, like, say, if you're a restaurant that has a restroom, you could sign on to the Louis app and offer your restroom to the general public. Wow. And they pay, they pay like the general public pays say like a $25 a month subscription and they can use this network of restrooms around the city. Oh, that's kind of cool. What it, was cool. It? It, 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 I guess it couldn't get enough customers. Wow. I don't know. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So um, Jimmy says, speaking of Houston, how do you think you should play out with their power grid? Would this have any effect on the power grid? I'm not, is it, 
I may be, we may be asking questions that are outside <laughs> of your world. We hit you with a pandemic. Now we're hitting you with the power grid. <laughs> Do, do you have a feeling how this would play out? I really, don't have, I really don't have an opinion, no. I mean, I, I I haven't studied the Houston power grid enough to, or the Texas power grid. From what I understand, it's very complicated and it's very regulated. Yep. And I would imagine that has a lot to do with the, the recent events, um, but otherwise not an expert. There we go. Steve brings up a very valid yeah. point. He says, some of the ideas I'm hearing here are good all for building anything anywhere it boggles the mind how we can build self-storage all over but not small dorms for the homeless that is such a valid point i see self-storage everywhere but i don't see i don't see dorms for the homeless i mean right it, it's a great point because <clears throat> it just shows how everything is so arbitrary mm -hmm. and, and we've learned to live with it and i don't think we ever most people, even like a lot of constitutional conservatives and, and libertarians, don't necessarily stop to think, how absurd is it that when you build a building, the ground level has to be office or retail, mm -hmm. and the floors above have to be ha housing? I don't know. So if, yeah. if you want to talk about like the epitome of central planning, I mean, this is like going into a restaurant and saying 10% of your entrees have to be pizza and... <laughs> <laughs> and 90% of what you sell has to be pasta. It's yeah. just like, it's so fundamentally absurd. And um, what I see in Queens, where, where I live in, in Astoria is almost always you can see one side of the street will be all stores on the bottom mm -hmm. and then apartments on top. And the other side of the street is all single family or, or two family homes, not apartments, homes. You go down yeah. one more block and they swap it. One side is all apartments. The other side is homes. And the apartment side has no trees. But the home side has trees. So you can walk down the street and see exactly what people were building. It's crazy. My neighborhood is exactly like that. Just what you're yeah. saying is what my neighborhood is. It's like someone planned the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. Yes. It's nuts. So uh, Tim says, home-based business bans hurt the poor and minorities. They force us to do business with the big guys, in quotes. Be a mechanic or a plumber, it discourages on-the-job training. It hurts kids who might want to earn a few bucks. It's actually even worse than I'm, than, than I'm trying to make it sound. Yeah, it is pretty bad, Tim. It is actually worse. So, yeah. I mean, you, you, you have to have a, a moral or ethical argument here, don't you, Scott? I mean, you do, right? Yeah, and I mean... So I'm originally from Virginia, and when and when I'm in Virginia and need an auto repair, there's kind of a network of people who probably illegally um, do auto repair out of their their home, their home workshop or garage. They're way cheaper than going to a brick and mortar auto repair. I mean, cheaper in the order of magnitude, like half as much to do the mm. same thing as a brick and mortar. And we we all know this is true. We know why it's true because they have less fixed costs than the brick and mortar does. And so yeah. Um, the more bottom-up entrepreneurship, the more competition, the more they undercut each other's prices, the better it is for the consumer. So it, it, it's not even helping, it's not only just helping the entrepreneur, but this bottom-up deregulation is also helping the consumer and mm. creating a competition in the marketplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, guys, again, if you want more on, on Scott, please head over to marketurbanismreport.com. See what he's doing. Check him out. Um, if you're running for office, some people are running for office, reach out to them. Get some cool policy tips. Do that. They, I'm sure they're going to help you out with that. So, Scott, anything you want to talk about before we wrap this up? Am I some piece you want to you want to talk about or bring up or some topic I missed? Uh, I think we we covered a lot. I mean, the only thing I would add is, along with going to, to my blog, there's a great Facebook group, Market Urbanism Report Facebook group, 10,000 members strong rabid conversation every single day. It's very politically diverse. And the, the um, link, by the way, is in the description. I put the link to that group in the description. So guys, if you want it, click that link, head right over there. Yeah. Absolutely. Can I ask you one final question? Sure. In New York City, what's the first step? Is there a first step or is it just too big that you can't do a first step? You got to do a whole big thing. I mean, I, I'm just curious. It's a monster. Is there a first step? Or do I have to do like eight things at once? It It's going to be a mind-blowing suggestion. But um, I would love to see 
the the MTA experiment with privatization, particularly the subways. Mm-hmm. In Hong Kong, they have a they had a once public um, company that or incorporation that ran their subways and get this, it went public because it's profitable. It's an IPO. Wow, look at that. that. Profitable rail. And the way they're profitable is they also own a lot of lands around the stations and they build it as densely as possible. And um, it's it's a great example of how not only does it provide great service, but again, it's profitable. So it's not a net cost to taxpayers. We got to do something different with the MTA. The MTA is like, is like the anti-Hong Kong. Yes, I mean, it like, is. It's a, it's a state-run bureaucracy that is about as inefficient as it could possibly be, underutilizes its land holdings, and um, they got to look abroad to see best practices. There we go. You heard it. That's the first thing. Scott, let us know. MTA, first thing, New York City, that's the answer. Scott, so thank you so much for coming on and giving me uh, some of your evening. I appreciate that. Um, everybody else, thank you so much for showing up and commenting and going back and forth. Again, please check him out, marketurbanizationreport.com. Scott, thank you so much for coming. Everyone else, I will see you all very soon.